Cosmos with Cosmos. Yeah, I kind of butchered that anyway. But welcome to Cosmos with Cosmos. As always, I'm Mike. I'm Liz. No, Brandon. No. Brandon's at the airport. He's on assignment. Back on assignment. Back on assignment. Welcome to episode 98, where we talk about one Percival Lowell. Yeah. The man who built an observatory to find life on Mars, but the observatory found a planet instead, which became a dwarf planet. <laughs> which then, <laughs> and then lost his planet a status. Saga. But definitely recommend if you're in uh, in the Flagstaff area of Arizona, Flagstaff checking Arizona, out the whole yeah. observatory. Um, yeah, so we'll be talking about Percival Law today and um, all that, but uh, before we get started, what you drinking? Oh, I am drinking uh, a hot Percy. <laughs> a hot Percy. A hot Percy. It's uh, some apple spice cinnamon tea with uh, some bourbon. Oh, you have apple spice tea? Yeah. In my, nice. in my backup drink, actually, I... I uh, um, because I only have one packet of the apple spice cinnamon tea left, so my bat, my second drink, I have a lemon orange tea, oh. um, with the bourbon and some. That's uh, gonna, so that's a true like hot toddy kind of your backups to true hot toddy. Well, yeah, with more of the lemon and the bourbon. Even mm-hmm. though usually you don't use tea, you just do like warm. You just do hot water, you know, with it. Um, and then I, but I also added some brown cinnamon sugar syrup mm. uh, to it because you know, in a hot toddy, you would do like brown sugar or like. Like a simple syrup with the lemon and the bourbon. So it's it's been rainy here. Uh, it's very wet outside and nice and chilly in fall. The leaves are changing, so I wanted something a little warm. We'll see how long the sweatshirt lasts on me uh, as I drink this hot beverage. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's cozy. And uh, actually, I haven't tried it yet. Let's see. I like the slurp. <laughs> and it's good. Ooh, ooh, it's good. It's good. Jack Tabasco Cinnamon Hot Cocoa. Spicy and sweet. I don't know. I haven't been a big fan of like like the Mexican chocolates where they have like the, the spiciness with the chocolate. I don't know about it. But, so you're not sure about Tabasco? And and the uh and yeah. the chocolate, yeah. But I, 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 let's go. Well, you know. It's adventurous. Uh, I would try it. I would try it. Well, we don't have Tabasco though. We'll need to get some. No, we have Frank's. We have Frank's. Yeah. All okay, right. What are you drinking? I am. Um, it's called Planet X. It's got. Um, uh, it's got. What does it got? It's got vanilla <laughs> vodka, cinnamon whiskey, um, Snapple apple. Snapple apple. Um, and. Um, Snapple apple. Uh, cinnamon brown sugar syrup. And oh, so, we both use fr- cinnamon brown sugar syrup. What except mine is cold. I can't do. Uh, um, I can't do the. Hot. Oh, I mean, I have to be in the mood for hot. Yeah, drinks. no. Once it gets, once it starts getting cooler out, then I like to have. Like, I drink tea. I drink. I drink a lot of tea every day. Just regular tea, not spiked tea. Um, but I just bought a whole bunch of teas on Amazon. Although oh. I wish I got more green tea. I need more green tea. Uh, I got a lot of different black teas um, and some sleepy, you know, not caffeine free teas for the evenings. But mm-hmm. you'd be great in England. Hello, Governor. Would you like some tea and crumpets? I'd be a very cockney. I take very back, cockney British. I take back everything British. I just said. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we're going to start a war. Anyway, uh, follow us on all the things um, on Twitter because I refuse to call it the other thing. Um, which call is... it Twix. Oh, wait, that's already <laughs> trademarked by Twix. Twix. <laughs> um, Anyway, follow us on Twitter um, at Drinking Cosmos. It's Cosmos with Cosmos with for everything else. Uh, rate us on everything, um, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your uh, podcast. Um, don't forget to join us for the Hangover and after. Click like and subscribe because that's what everybody's yeah. apparently. Oh yeah, we don't have a button, right? Um, it comes up at the end. <laughs> Uh, don't forget to join us for the hangover after this uh, amazing episode where we talk about Percy. Yeah. Per- not Percival Percy Jackson, <laughs> not the lightning thief. No, uh, we're the, talking about Percy the Lowell. Planet um, thief. What? Percy Lowell, the planet thief. The planet thief, yeah. <laughs> um, also, while you are 
perusing the interwebs. While you're just scrolling, don't doom scrolling and otherwise. Yeah, go to um, Etsy and check out Wild Ixia. Mm-hmm. Wild Ixia. Ixia is I X I A. Check out all her amazing art. Also, check out the Mr. Proctor Show. Well, I think it also is Mr. Proctor Show Sucks or something. Or Ron we Proctor really need to stop doing this every single episode I and know, actually right? look it up. And, and Well, by the time we get to the, the end of the episode, I forgot. Oh, Jack says X is pronounced uh, sh, uh, sh, she. So Twitter becomes shitter. <laughs> like it. I yeah. Like it. Um, okay. And also, speaking of Jack, if you are in the Council Bluffs, Iowa area, then check out the Rolling Bluffs Planetarium. You can find out more information about what Jack is up to at rollingbluffsplanetarium.com. Have I ever mentioned before that the band Slipknot is from Iowa? During a podcast when we that talk about... That explains a lot. That explains a lot. <laughs> anyway, every time, we, every time we talk about Jack, uh, Jack's Planetarium uh, and we say Iowa, I always think of Slipknot. Just Slipknot pops in my head briefly. Uh, yeah. Anyway... <laughs> Um, also, the shot, little shot size nuggets of Just astronomy. Shooters of astronomy. Shooters of astronomy. It. Astronomy shooters. Astronomy shooters. Shooter. Astro shooters. Can we trademark that? Astro shooters. Anyway, <laughs> um, that's every other Wednesday. When's the next one coming out? Because the calendar's all crazy. We just had one come out on November 1st, the day after Halloween, and that shot is about Halloween! So check it out. Because I messed up my shot release dates and when the episodes came out. <laughs> All right, so check out the shot. Uh, it, it, I think it's one of our most favorite things to do. Yeah, we love doing the shot. We love doing the shots. Um, it's dangerous, but we love doing the shot. <laughs> yeah. um, also, we have rules. This first one is probably going to be... Um, Addressed at some point today, if the if a dog barks, and in the notes it says puppy bark, and we have a legit we puppy have a legit in puppy. the house. We so, have a legit puppy. You know, oh, Mira is just oh so adorably sweet. She's just the sweetest thing. The if, sweetest thing. You know Wants to play. Maybe maybe in the hangover, we'll Mike will pick her up and bring her in, and then pick her up and put her back out because yeah. if she's on her legs, the whole set our set yeah, we'll will be destroyed. destroyed. But maybe we'll give her her little her first little cameo. Um, also, if there's a Star Wars reference or a Lord of the Rings reference, take it from me. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so let's talk Percy here, not the rover. Um, Percival Lowell. Oh, it's not Perseverance Lowell. It's such a rich fucking name, Percival. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Katie in chat says, Potato is demanding a walk. She'll be listening in back soon. That's Potato is her cat, everybody. Potato is a black oh. cat, a feisty black cat. Spicy, she demands big, walks. Right, not yellow walks. She eyes. doesn't have a harness. She goes in a backpack and she takes a walk with this little astronaut backpack. It's got a little with, bubble for her face. But to just look the, out. the brightest yellow eyes. Oh, God, she's it's beautiful. The, pose the perfect like Halloween she's cat. Like the anyway, perfect Halloween anyway, cat. let's focus. Okay. I can't believe I gotta reel you. You are in charge. When I'm All in right. charge, I gotta so, reel you in. Um brief bi- uh, biography. I was gonna say biology. A <laughs> brief biology of Percival Lowell. What's his does he have a middle name? Uh, yes, I did not write oh, it down. Okay. <laughs> um, Percival Plutarch. It's something. Oh. It's something. I, yeah, I didn't write it down. Anyway, March 13th, 1855. First. Oh, no, no. March 13th. I was thinking because Katie's birthday. It was, it's a different month after 13th. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, oh. Two months earlier, yeah. plus like a couple centuries. All right, 18. Anyway, 1855. Uh, Percival Lowell, born in Beantown, which is where? Starts with a B. Boston. Boston. I want it to be Chicago. I know, because they had the big they bean. They had the big bean, so they there should the, be bean town. This is like... my argument for life in a hill that I will die on. A bean that I will die on. I will die on that bean. Anyway, um, Percival Lowell, born March 13th, 1855. Um, like Jesus, we have a gap in the years from birth to the next time he shows up. Oh, just... <laughs> yeah. What was he doing in that gap? Just tootling, just... Learning carpentry. Building furniture. <laughs> yeah. Um, he he graduated from Harvard with distinction in 1876 with oh a degree in mathematics. Hey, with distinction. Yeah, with the, so he did he did well at Harvard. He did well, yes. Uh, yes. Very smart guy. Um, in fact, at his graduation from Harvard, he gave a speech. And he gave a speech about the nebular theory, which is a theory about how the solar system formed. 
Uh, and it was considered advanced at the time. And this it dude pretty nebulous. just finished college, you know? And so. He just finished uh, college and he's. Yeah, and not even in astronomy. The mathematics is what he goes Yeah, in, but so. I, you need math to do astronomy, so. So things are looking up for Percival. And what does he do? Look up. Well, well, not Eventually. yet. Not yet. <laughs> he kind of looked down. He oh. ran a cotton mill for six years, as one does. You graduate at Harvard with distinction. In Talk about the f- formation of the solar system or whatever. And, me. Run and then mill. go, I'm going to run a cotton mill. Mm-hmm. All right. I guess you got to make money. It is, you know, industri- height of the industrial. Is, he doesn't need to make money. He's rich as fuck already. His oh. family is really rich. Oh, oh, they're rich Bostonites or something. Yeah. Like. And so, mm-hmm. um, in fact, there was a quote. It's, it's in that um, A Short History of Everything book uh-huh. that we were reading. By Bill Bryson, A Short History of Nearly Everything. Of nearly it's a everything. great book. Um, I didn't look it up. I, could, I tried to find it online. didn't look it up. We went and got a cheeseburger, so then forgot about it. But uh, there, there is a quote about um, the lulls mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and basically the hierarchy of Boston and just below God is are the lulls. Really? That is, that is how high up. I mean, I've read the book, so I should know that, but, you know, I. That's how high up in society they are read, in Boston. So. Wow, okay. and anyway, so it's starting in 1876, he runs a, uh, a cotton mill for six years, yeah, and then decides in the 1880s, he's going to go travel throughout Asia. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. That seems, I don't know, just world travel um, before airplanes. Yeah, it takes a while to get there, right? It seems like just so, a nightmare, I mean. So he goes to Japan and Korea, and he actually writes four books. He writes four books on... And this on, is when Korea was one Korea. Yeah, that was, and I did think about that actually today. I was thinking about it. And so um, he goes to Japan and Korea. He, he writes four books about Japanese and Korean culture. Oh, wow. I didn't know yeah. he was an anime fan. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, in fact, in 1883, he served as a foreign secretary and counselor for the U.S. diplomatic mission to Korea. Wow, okay. Yeah. He only lived in Korea, though, for three months. And then I guess he went did more Did he learn Japan. any Japanese, Korean? I'm sure he did. It was not mentioned, oh, but I'm okay, sure he okay. did. Okay. Um, enough to write books um, yeah. and all that. While in Asia in 1892, he became a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And the next year, he decides he's going to move back to the U.S. And so now he comes back to the U.S. How old is he now? How do people have time to accomplish all these things in their lives? He, I guess there's no, <laughs> less he distractions. Is, uh, he is 38 years old at this point. That's ish. That's, so uh, demoralizing <laughs> for myself. Yeah, yeah. What have you done with your life? We've moved to Oak Ridge. We've um, a bunch of funkos and. <laughs> Hey. You've collected a bunch of hunkos and... <laughs> um, so he gets back to the U.S. He reads a book called La Planet... 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 is like for the Greek word for Yeah, planets. but I think this is French or Spanish. Cool. Uh, Le Planet Mars by Camille Flammarion. Let me read. Let me look at your... Flammarion. Let me... Because we all know I'm great at languages. Camille Fl- Flammarion. Hey, there you go. Um, so he reads that book. He, he is um, inspired by it. Mm-hmm. Um, he also learns of Giovanni Seppervelli's Giovanni Seppervelli. I'm so sorry, Federico, but every time I'm going to do it and I will apologize. Um, where uh, uh, Seppervelli talks about the canal on Mars. He looked at, uh, yes. uh, looked at Mars through a telescope and he saw these lines and he called them canali. Canals. The, well, oh, canali, okay, which just means channels in yes. Italian, I think, mm-hmm. but it was mistranslated to canals, that's right. and that's what Percival Lowell read. That's right, because Americans are dumb. Uh, and then it was all this whole thing about like, oh, c- canals are made by people here on Earth, so that means that those yeah. could be made by aliens on Mars. Don't steal the thunder. Okay. Um, 1893, uh, 1894, so winter of 93 uh, and 94. Mm-hmm. Late 93, early 94, he used his immense wealth and influence and dedicated himself to astronomy. In fact, built the Lowell Observatory. 
in Flagstaff, Arizona. Why? Well, I mean... We'll get to why. Oh, okay, okay. okay. We will get to why. In, in 1904, so 10 years later, he receives the pre-Jules Jansen Award from the Astronomical Society of France, which is their highest award. Um, why, uh, why is he so? Why do the French people like him so much? Um, it uh, he he received the award for contributions basically that he's made to astronomy. Oh, what did he? What we'll contrib- get to oh, it. Okay. What? Why are you wanting to jump ahead? So? Well, I'm just because it seems. I said like... it's a brief biography. Oh, okay. <laughs> we only have one more event. Okay. Okay. I'm like I'm like, but what did he do? We'll get to that. I want to know. Uh, <laughs> On November 12th, 1916, he died in Flagstaff, Arizona from a stroke. He was 61 years old. He was um, a passionate pacifist. And so World War I affected him. Broke his heart. Broke his heart. But also at this point in the game, a lot of the stuff that he has believed has um, been kind of disproven. And so it just kind of contributed to his, his health going downhill and Man. died of a stroke and he's buried um uh, on mars hill in um in a tomb at, at flagstaff did we go see his tomb? we did we, we well we went on the outside i think okay okay i don't remember it I can't yeah recall. all right I'm, so I'm, I'm always i'm always down for a good tomb <laughs> yeah um so let's talk about percy goes west a nice five old reference. Brandon would appreciate that five old reference. Yeah, but it's also um and there's a chapter in Lord of the Rings where the ring goes south. Oh, so there's, so all, there's well, that. okay. Well now now we have to drink because you uh The Ring goes south and Percy goes west. Percy goes west. He's gonna hunt some planet. <laughs> yeah. Um so May 28, 1894, he opens the door, first light, to the Lowell Observatory. Ooh. Yes, and so he uh, he goes west. In fact, he goes to Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a couple of hours north, directly north, pretty much, of Phoenix, Arizona. Mm-hmm. You just mm-hmm. go right up the I-17 from mm-hmm. Phoenix, run right into it. Um, he chose Flagstaff because it had an elevation of 7,000 feet. And few cloudy nights, and was far from city lights. Was like, a, I guess he didn't want to go down. Was Kit Peak already? Uh... I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Uh, same kind of situation. Wait, there. few cloudy nights? Doesn't it snow a lot? It does snow a lot, but for. I guess he's higher. High, well, yeah. I, um, so... I mean, you want to be a high elevation where it's cooler for a telescope, so. Yeah, and you get high up, and the atmosphere is a little more stable. And uh, in fact, Lowell Observatory is the first observatory in the entire world that was deliberately located in a remote place at high elevation. The first one to be deliberately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What? Yeah. So they made the conscious choice to go yeah. on top of a mountain. That was the first one. It's the first one, and in fact, we still do it today. Mauna Kea, Kit that, Peak. I mean, nobody else before him was like, nobody. hey, we should probably be high up and nope. remote. He was the first. Oh, shit. I didn't know that. Yeah, he that... was the first. How I didn't know, I didn't know that either, to be honest, until we, I started doing yeah. research for it. And so he... Um, in the world? In the world, yes. <laughs> there may have been people who already lived on top of a mountain and put the telescope right, up there, right. but, but he I was just, the first okay, one I just that feel like... deliberately went... To a higher elevation. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's all you need it's for this podcast, right? That blow my mind. I mean, but yeah, I mean, there, there has to be a first one, right? Yeah, somewhere, but it's just surprising but that's the first that's the one. one. You would think it would be, I don't know, somewhere in probably Europe or something. Yeah, <laughs> no, Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, and I'm not even sure that that was on. The Lowell Observatory's website. I think I got that elsewhere. Really? Well, yeah. Lowell Observatory, take note. You've got to put that shit on your website. Put that in a little information packet. Yeah. Claim so, to fame right there. Forget <laughs> forget flutes. So he builds this observatory um, on top of a mountain in Flagstaff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, it's built 
to find proof, uh, to search for proof of intelligent, intelligent life on Mars. Mm. Because Lowell was not the first person to see these lines going across yeah. Mars. Obviously, Schiaparelli mm -hmm. saw them too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he wants, he believed that it was, he, he hypothesized that the canals were built by an intelligent and advanced society that was desperate to bring water from the poles, mm -hmm. the ice mm -hmm. caps at the poles, mm -hmm. down to the dry, the arid, area. desert, deserty right. equator because that's area. what people would, that's what we would do. Yeah. And so he wanted to prove it. And mm -hmm. so he spent the next 15 years, um, 1893 to 1908, making extensive drawings of what he thought were surface features of Mars. Oh, wow. He made the conscious effort to use smaller aperture telescopes instead of the bigger ones uh, because he felt like that gave him better views of the planet he was looking at, and that obviously was his downfall. Right, because you want bigger, you want bigger, bigger the collect. more light, the more you see, the better resolution. Yeah, you yeah, get. you want better resolution, and... Um, and so the bigger it is, it gives you, it gives you, it collects more light. So the, the, the bigger the diameter, but also the focal length is what mm -hmm. allows you to get that resolution mm -hmm. that, that you need, that you okay. want. And smaller telescopes really aren't going to do that for you yeah. on both, both counts. Yeah. And so, it's like at the big boys, the big observatories, the top of mountains. Yeah. And so he, um, and the even bigger boys in space. So he did this uh, with the smaller telescopes and um, just extensively drew out mm -hmm. everything. And he published three books in those 15 years. In 1895, a, just a book called Mars. Um, and <laughs> what do you want to call it? Her, mm -hmm. Purse. Purse. What you want to call this? Mars. 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 Mars, Mars. Fine. Mars is fine. That's all you need yeah. Mars. Is that Mars? Mars drawings? Mars. So he did. Or to be Mars. Mars. He's Boston. Mars. Mars. It's called um, Mars, boys. We're calling it Mars. But, but is, is, it's a high society Boston accent, which I can't do. So I don't it's know what it is. Mars? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> anyway, 1895, he, he publishes that book that has his drawings. Um, 11 years later, 1906, he expands the title and it becomes Mars and its Canals. Oh, okay. So that, um, it's that still got, the sequel, uh, not just Mars, Mars and the Canals. Yeah. Um, and then in 1908, two years later, Mars is the abode of life. Mars as the abode of life. Abode of life. The home of life. Mars is the home of life. All right. You know, All right. I mean. He thought so anyway. It's like red Mars, blue Mars, green Mars. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. I, <laughs> I know, right? Um. <laughs> I was not expecting you to bring that reference to him, and that was, uh, <laughs> very good. Usually it's me and Brandon that bring I know, because I don't read a lot of books. <laughs> um, all right, so he he does all of these drawings and, and releases these books, and he makes detailed descriptions of what he called non-natural features. So in, here on Earth, we, they would be called man-made features. <laughs> um and like I said, or now we can call them human-made features. Human-made yeah. features. Um, and like I said, he hypothesized that these canals, these features, were mm -hmm. built by intelligent um, life bringing water from the poles. Right. right. Um, the problem is, most all astronomers couldn't see the features that Lowell was seeing. Really? Where, yeah. Was he drawing? <laughs> Um, you remember, he's using these smaller telescopes. Uh -huh. Pretty much everybody else is using these larger telescopes. Right. And so they're getting better views. Right, so they're not seeing... He's seeing, like, what, blurry details of mm -hmm. larger... They're not seeing it the same way because yeah. they have better equipment. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and and we're going to find that, um, that Lowell is not making... They're really the best decisions, at least with Mars and Venus, because he's he's gonna mm -hmm. he's gonna look at Venus too. But um, he's not making the best decisions on what equipment to use. Right. Well, he's not a trained astronomer. 
No, it was a mathematician. He's a mathematician that ran a cotton mill for some yeah. odd reason <laughs> and then got some high uh, fellows award or whatever. In, yeah, uh, but <laughs> um, uh, but he 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 was inspired right by right. the work of other astronomers and uh-huh. and things like that. If and Galileo can draw shit through his telescope, then I'll just look through mine and draw stuff too. You know, like, but Galileo interpreted things a little bit better than <laughs> what. Percival all did, but um, um, even though astronomers were not um, buying it, the general public, oh yeah, humanity, we love aliens. Um, the 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 imagination of the public oh, was yeah. electrified by it. Yeah, aliens, ca- canals yes. on Mars, like that's fun. Yeah, yeah we want to go for that. We don't want a boring, lifeless, barren, dusty planet. I know, right? And Mars is amazingly fascinated as a devoid, barren planet. But <laughs> and as we'll, as I'll mention later, um, it it inspired H. G. Wells' War of Worlds. See, that's and cool. so um, yeah. you know all of that, uh-huh. and so uh-huh. um, yeah, so he electrifies the public with his thoughts and his mm-hmm. drawings mm-hmm. and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but astronomers weren't buying it. And um, the, the professionals were like, "All right." <laughs> and 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 by the time he he dies, it's pretty much been disproven. Right, right. But it doesn't officially become disproven until the nineteen sixties when the Mariner spacecraft. Oh, when we actually have to send a spacecraft to Mars and go, yeah, there's no canals here. Yeah, no. Um, we got a close up look, boys, and uh, nothing but dirt. Yeah, and holes in the ground. Yeah, but no, no canals, no canals. We got a real big canyon, though. Yeah, we, we got do. A real big canyon. Uh, named after a spacecraft, Mariner Valley. Um, but um, the canals were actually optical illusions. Um, you know, it's coming from, you know, the optics, also his then, choice of small telescopes. And, and what your eyes want them to be and, or interpret them as. And there, um, he actually is, There, there's a school of psychology that talks about, um, and I don't, I only knew this from research for this. Um, okay. Um, it's, it's called like, um, Gestalt, Gestalt, Gestalt. Yeah. Um, um, school of psychology where, or thought of psychology theory or whatever it is, where humans, um, try to make, uh, these larger connections, um, with the, you'll see these lines and they try to make larger patterns that might not be there. Uh, um, yes. And so, yes. Um, yes. so the optical illusion of of um, the equipment he's using and all that, combined with just our wanting right. to make sense yes. of you know what looks like chaos, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. contributed to. Sometimes our brains try to think too much. They they overthink it, um, <laughs> and so um, that is what contributed to all of that yeah all right so his first um his first thing um canals on mars goes down in flames eventually so let's let's continue oh percy let's continue sorry buddy with other things he looked at a lot of people got shit wrong too <laughs> so he's over for one he's over for one right now um all right <laughs> all right so let's move on um he he's he's really famous for two things, he, a Mars obviously in his observatory, mm-hmm. and while he's looking at Mars, he also decides that he wants to look at Venus. Oh, that's nice. You know, a little yeah. a little uh, you know uh, quality for the fairer planet. Yeah, exactly. So in eighteen ninety six, Lowell makes observations of Venus. Mm-hmm. Mid eighteen ninety six is when he did it. Yeah. For some reason, he decides to do this during the day. Um, and so, uh, he, instead of making his observations at night, he makes it during the day. Why? Um, I, maybe only he can answer that question. The sun is up during the day. Yeah. What do you... And so, he has this... How would you even find Venus during the day? Oh, you can do it. Um, when I worked at Melton Observatory, uh, and, I, and Melton has a connection just so tangentially um to this um um 
We could uh, we could spot Venus during the daytime. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess it, it's you know enough. where it is. I mean, yeah, I guess if you yeah. know, you know, you, you know where it is, you can just point the telescope at it. Yeah. But Pretty much exactly. It, but you're not gonna. All right. So, he's using a large 24-inch Alvin Clark and Sons telescope. This is the Melton Observatory connection. That Melton Observatory is the observatory at the University of South Carolina campus, which is where I worked. I worked at that observatory. Mm -hmm. Um, we had an Alvin and Clark telescope. Um, it was 18 inches, um, not 24 inches, but, um, and we had received it actually from Chicago and it, it came in. So we were using kind of the same equipment That's that, cool. um, uh, Percy was. I guess Theodore got left out. I guess he did. Yeah. <laughs> no, it would be perfect if it was Alvin and Simon. Simon. It was yeah. Alvin and Simon telescope, but. Um, okay. So he so he wouldn't friggin' blind himself. Yeah, because it's daytime. And also to cut down on seeing the turbulence of the atmosphere, because yeah, he's observing it daytime. in the daytime, where the atmosphere <laughs> is receiving this energy from the sun, yeah. and so it's very turbulent. He had to f-stop it down. So he basically took it from two feet across, 24 inches, down to three inches. So it, it became a three-inch telescope. <laughs> First of all, Mr. Lowell, uh, could you do you not have any astronomer friends that you can talk to that can be like, here, here's how you use a telescope, and here's <laughs> um, here's how telescopes work. <laughs> so he's looking at Venus in the daytime, basically through a three-inch telescope, and well, you're you're seeing the what? Nothing. I'll, what are you what seeing? he's gonna see stuff, and it's not what you're expecting. Okay. So. Um, he, he observes spokes on Venus. Spokes? Like, spokes. Like spokes in, like, like lines. Okay. Yeah. And, and also a dark spot on Venus. Again, no other astronomers can see these things. He attributes to the surface. What, to be fair, though, they didn't, they they didn't, didn't quite know. know. And so, um, Venus was... Uh, no matter what telescope you use to look at Venus, that we normal you're people not would seeing use, the surface of Venus. You're not seeing the surface. You're seeing the clouds. You need some um, radar it's, imaging. Is it's pretty featureless. Yeah. You need extremely large telescopes, and f stopping a, a twenty four down to a three is not a large telescope. No. At this point. It I just want to jump in real fast. We were watching Jeopardy, and Venus was uh, the answer to one of the questions. But they sh it was a and it was an image, uh, a picture question. But they showed a picture of Venus through radar imaging, uh, and we knew it. Of course, immediately we we're like Venus. But then they, the radar they imaging. Say Mars? Yeah, yeah. Someone said Mars. The radar imaging totally fucked them up because they weren't expecting. Yeah, uh, and they were you expecting know, more Venus looking with the its cloud cover. And and to be fair though, I mean it, it does have that radar. Afterwards, I was like, oh, that was tricky, Jeopardy. That was a tricky that, one. Yeah. <laughs> what well, was that? The Magellan Magellan yeah, data. Um, yeah, it does look. They it's colored kind of this reddish orange, um, and so with like yellow, yellow. For, like the for the volcanoes and stuff, and and, stuff yeah. and so it looks very, it looks Marsish in a way. Yeah. So, um, oh, where am I? Okay, so he observes these uh, what he calls spokes and his dark spot on Venus. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, stopping the telescope down, um, taking it from twenty four inches to three inches, uh, may have inadvertently created what is called. And I just cannot say this. Optho ophthalmoscope. Um, it is actually something a the people who do your eyes, opto optometry. Opto yeah. Yeah, those dudes. Um, what they use to look in your eyes. And Lowell was actually observing the shadow of his blood vessels cast it's, upon his that's own what eyes, retina. That's what happens when, like, I look through telescopes sometimes. I'm, like, seeing my own, like, I'm, like, seeing my eyelashes or I'm, uh, I'm seeing, like, some part of my, like, eyeball or whatever. Yeah. So he's seeing his own eye he's back seen, at it. Oh, yeah. First of but all. This is, this is a recent understanding of what he was seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it took about a hundred years, 110 years for, um, uh, people to really kind of figure it out. It was, it was like around 2006 <laughs> that, uh, that they were able to go, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. 
Hold on, this is probably ah, what he. At least, uh, at least no one. He never. He ne- He didn't have to find out he was looking at his own eye because that's just <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, I mean, it really is. It really is. So uh, it's a wave to Brandon who can't hear us, but he can't see us he either. Which is the podcast? Wait, can he, see us? he can't. He can see us. He can't hear us, but he wishes um, the podcast be fruitful and that the listeners profit. I don't know, the listeners aren't profiting from anything other than knowledge. So, Percy. Over two. Oh no! Yes. Oh, but we have a third thing. <sighs> we have a third thing he tried to do: the search for Planet X. Oh. Yes. All right. Oh, so. Boy. Um, oh boy! Everybody tries to search for Planet X, and and. All right. So, obviously, Percival Lowell himself is going to strike out on. But and so he's gonna go over three. Mm-hmm. Well, um, oh, you know what? Let's but, give him the ben- Let's give him one point for having the first goddamn observatory built on a mountain oh, purposefully. Let's oh, give yeah. him that. Oh, oh, yeah. Wait, yeah. wait till you get to his legacy. So, okay, okay, okay. Um, um, and so yeah. So I forgot what I was gonna say. I don't know what Planet X were right um, <laughs> in that direction. All right. So, in 1906, and when he starts looking for Planet X, okay. we, we already know that um, Uranus and Neptune, they seem to have this kind of, is, they, they aren't kind of where they're supposed to be. Right, they're doing a little weird. Um, and, so, um, and so, the thought was, is that there was a planet, mass of planet pulling on it. This was this is not unprecedented. Yeah, that's because uh, with Uranus, yeah. Uranus was not where it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. There had to be something pulling on it. Mm-hmm. Turned out it was Neptune, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so um, the same thought process was going on with this. And so um, um, Percival Lowell starts to look for it and mm-hmm. Planet X, and, and he, he is a mathematician. He is a mathematician. Um, he employs. Human computers, which I just absolutely love. Human computers. Human computers that um, are they women? Yes, they are for the most part always, always women. women. Um, Elizabeth Williams um, was the human computer that uh, mm-hmm. that led the other human computers, um, but they were uh, their obviously their main job was to calculate to compute. Right. So where they're Planet mathematicians. X would be. Yes, uh, where they would be, um, and so so they did that. So the search is on, um, and in fact, for the next ten years until his death, he's looking for Planet X, um, among other things. But he's he's really kind of concentrating on Planet X, um, and in fact, in 1915, Lowell Percival Lowell photographs Pluto. He photographs it. But he thinks it's a star. And so he doesn't realize I mean, it's it a is common, what it is. I mean, that is a, you know, that's a common mistake. That's easy to do. Mm-hmm. Easy to think it's a star. You know? You just yep. need that uh, a lot of observational da- data to then see, the, oh, shit, wait, this star's moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, so should be moving this fast. And so in 1915, he photographs it, but he doesn't realize what it is. And... Um, and he, you know, kind of just move, moves on, um, get that, get that little bug. Um, yes. Yes. he moves on, um, from there. Um, 1930, obviously. God, attacked by gnats. Um, well, the next year, obviously, um, um, uh, Percival Lowell dies and, um, um, a decade and a half later, Clyde Tombaugh discovers Pluto using the telescopes at the Observatory. Rest in Pluto, Percival. <laughs> yes. But to honor Percival Lowell, mm-hmm. um, the, the symbol that was chosen for Pluto um, is a combination of the P and the L for Percival Lowell. Oh, that's right. That's right. And also, P and L for Pluto. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, so in the end... Um, uh, the Lowell Observatory gets its planet. Um, and Percival Lowell. And if Percival Lowell were alive. It's nothing. <laughs> in 1930, he would um, 
Uh, he would say, there's more than X. We have discovered well, more he, than X. Or would have Clyde still have, uh, Clyde Tombaugh still have found it. He Even didn't. if Percival Lowell was alive, wouldn't Clyde Tombaugh still have Oh, found yeah, it? I mean, Clyde would have, well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, you know, that that's kind of hard to say. But, oh, um, okay. Um, because, because Percival Lowell did not hire Clyde Tombaugh. Um, oh. And so, um. Oh, Clyde Tombaugh came after Percival Lowell? Yeah. He died? Yes. He came on after he died. Yeah. Okay. In okay. fact, I think I think uh, Clyde Tombaugh came around twenty nine thirty somewhere around you know. And when did Percival Lowell die again? Nineteen sixteen. Oh, that's a while. That's a gap. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. This is the way the way it is today. I just keep forgetting what I'm going to say. Um, yeah, but you know, look. Let's talk about his legacy a little bit. Oh, oh, I know what I was gonna say. So, um, if, if Percival Lowell were alive in 1930 when they found Pluto, mm -hmm. uh, discovered it, he would have said, "This is Planet X." Um, obviously, as time goes by mm -hmm. um, and we learn more, mm -hmm. uh, we realize that Pluto is not Planet no, X. It, it doesn't, doesn't have, have the mass. gravity. The yeah, mass it doesn't have, have the, the mass to tug to do on it. a fucking beast like Neptune. But and Uranus. Yeah, I know, but. We actually could not prove that until 1978. Um, we had to discover um, its moon Charon, Char Charon, uh, what, however you want to pronounce it. I think it's like Charon. Okay. I don't know. We had we had to find its moon in 1978. Yes. We find we find its moon, mm -hmm. and from that orbital dynamic, we're able to get the mass definitively for yes. Pluto. Yes. And we realize it's nowhere near it. No, but it's kind of cool because Pluto and Charon are like a double planet, basically. They orbit, their center of gravity is in between both of them, basically. Right. They're a binary, they're a binary they're planetary a binary system, planet. which is really kind of cool. But even combined, they can't yeah. budge Neptune and Uranus, those big boys. Even, even yeah. if you add... In, Pluto's what the size of uh, the U.S. in diameter? It, no, if it, it, if you put Pluto on the U.S., it would go from New York to the Mississippi. Right? Oh, okay. So it's half the half the U.S. Half the U.S. Okay. Our moon is bigger. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, in fact, if you take the mass of Pluto and its five moons and add them together, they have no effect on Uranus or Neptune. Just can't do it. Yeah. Um, and so, um, it was only relatively recently. Um, <laughs> but what's Pluto's GDP? <laughs> uh, it was only relatively recently that, um, oh no, it was Voyager, when Voyager flew past. Um, so that discrepancy um, had to do with the fact that we didn't actually know the mass of Neptune and Uranus. Um, and we did not get the, the true mass of those two until, until Voyager. Voyager flew past them. Uh, okay. Um, and then once the true mass was known, um, we, we thought we knew back in 1906, but we, we didn't. We a lot of things. We still do. Um, but once that, uh, once that, uh, those masses were, were known, the discrepancies went away. Oh, okay. So, but um, there's still a hunt for Planet X out there. They, well, yeah, because when you look at some of these other objects, mm -hmm. they have um, they have some strange uh, orbital characteristics mm -hmm. that can only be described, um, or yeah, that can only be uh, explained if you mm -hmm. have a I large have planet, planet X somewhere somewhere out there beyond beyond exactly. So Planet X is still kind of a thing. <laughs> Um, and you know what? Take a drink. Dogs. Oh. I don't know what they're barking at. <laughs> hey, leave. settle down. Right, settle down. <laughs> um, you know what? I'll I'll give him this. I'll give him I'll give him Planet X. Uh, he goes one for three. You'll uh, give him Planet X. I'll, I'll give him Planet X because there was a, he 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 saw Pluto. He did. He did see it. it but it's he one did. of those. I you know I Something can't. I would do. I cannot believe I'm doing baseball references and it's it's one of those things where he like swings at the ball and he just barely hits the ball and it's like it just kind of dribbles out onto the uh, infield and he's able to get a base hit out of it. 
<laughs> that's that's kind of what it is. Um, so Brandon will know all about that. So. <laughs> oh no, Brandon's upset with baseball right now. Uh, baseball. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about his legacy. Yes. All right. Um, on April 9th, 1907, um, he discovers asteroid 793 Arizona. So, discovers an asteroid. I think and, that's cool. Yeah. That's something. That is something. And um, um, this is about the only way I can describe it, the great populizer. Um, Wait, what's the great populizer? Lowell is. Lowell's the great populizer? Yeah, so even though most of his work was disproven, he is regarded as the most influential populizer of planetary science in, Amer in America before Carl Sagan. Because of the aliens. Um, aliens and, and all of that. Really? Yeah. There's nobody else that was really? Huh. Yeah. Um, he influenced science fiction. Well, so H.G. Yes. Wells' War of the Worlds, mm -hmm. his canals that he so fervently believed in, figure prominently in The Gods of War, uh, 1918, um, by Ed, Ed well, Rice Burroughs, Red Planet Mars. by Robert Heinlein in 1949, and The Martian Chronicles by Ray, Ray Bradbury in 1950. And so his, his, he really influenced um, these 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 writers, and you know, which then just fires the imagination of the public even more. Right, right. Uh, Brandon says science communication was looked down on until probably late Sagan. I wonder why he's not. Why? Why? Probably because no one was ever real good at it until Sagan came around and made it fun to listen to. Yeah. And hear about and relatable and made it so that it wasn't just all science jargony talk and, and math equations. Yeah, and, and you know, <laughs> scientists probably thought, you know, that's beneath them. Oh, uh, that's true. Oh, these peons of the general public, yeah. these these laymans, they don't they won't understand the science. Beneath them, not worthy of their efforts, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Hmm. And look, we have a, a lot of dumb people out there today because science wasn't properly communicated. Yeah, I mean, gotten into people's uh, people imagine, get excited about science. Imagine if science were revered as much as militaries, you know, or I was if, say baseball again. <laughs> if scientists were revered as much or more as than the Kardashians, yeah, exactly, or you know, Shayla titans Swift. of industry or generals and. Armies. Oh yeah, like the all the freaking well, the Musks and the Schwabs and the yeah, and that's not to say and, the... and that's not to say that some of these titans of industry aren't innovative. No, because they... most of them are robber barons, but some of them <laughs> yeah. are okay. Like uh, who's well, the who's no, no, the no, no, I, no. You can still be a robber baron and still be innovative. Um, you know, no, no. Who was the philanthropic Carn Carnegie? He Carnegie. was the more philanthropic. 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 Whatever the word is. Whatever language is. I don't, don't know. Don't blame it on the drinks. Whatever. Anyway, um, there are objects and features named for Lowell in the in the solar system. Well, yeah, sh there should be. Is there something Ast on Mars? We'll get there. Asteroid 1886 Lowell, discovered by Henry Gickless and Robert Schlada. Gickless? Gickless. G I C L. Oh, cool. yeah. that's. It's close. It's, it's like close. You can still take it there in middle school. <laughs> yeah. That's why I it's laughed. Right. That's why I laughed. Gosh. Because I'm in middle school. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gickless. Gickless. Anyway, uh, that was discovered in 1949. Um, and he named it after Lowell and said himself. Yeah. Themselves. Yeah. Yeah. 1849 uh, Gickless. <laughs> Uh, crater Lowell, both on the moon and Mars. So there's two craters named for him. One on the moon, the one on Mars. Just named Lowell? Yeah. Can't, don't you have to have some... All right. I don't know. Well, I guess there's multiple, like, Mount Doom, so... Yeah, and then we have the Lowell Reggio on Pluto, discovered by New Horizons in 2015. Ah, yes. Yes. There better be stuff named for Lowell on Pluto. <laughs> I know, right? You know? And um, Tom Baugh, to be fair. Um, he is responsible for, um, hiring Vesto Sliffer, who... I'm sorry, let's say this name again. Vesto Sliffer, who Vesto actually... Vesto Sliffer? Yeah. 
Sounds like some like villain name okay. out of a Bond movie. Okay. Um, we can have a whole show on him. Uh, sounds like alone. Sh- sounds like let a me, shot episode. Let me just tell you a few things uh-huh. that Mr. Schliffer did. Okay. Um, he showed the infrared that the infrared spectrum could be recorded using photographic emulsions or film, uh, photographic film. He did that in 1909. Okay. Okay. So oh. basically, able to take infrared pictures of ghosts. Okay. Um, Brandon said he thought it was Slifer. What did I say? Slifer. Oh, Slifer. Yeah, Slifer. Um, he showed that planets had ammonia and methane in their atmosphere. Um, he used spe- spectroscopy to investigate the rotational periods of planets and the composition of planetary atmospheres. He was the first to observe the shift of spectral lines of galaxies. In, in other words, he discovered the galactic redshift in 1912. Why, did, why haven't I heard of him? I don't know. He <laughs> measured the speeds in which spiral nebulae travel. He did that from 1912 and onward. In fact, uh, was his face Hubble... Um, Rely. I mean, he leaned on him quite a bit. Hubble uh, leaned on Vesto. Yeah, uh, yeah. He he. Of course, I mean, Hubble did his measurements too, but uh, that was a whole decade later. Um, and so, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, Slifer had already um, discovered it. Oh. So, um, but but he didn't make the the larger connection. He he believed. That these spiral nebulae. So there, at this time, there's this big debate. Yeah. What are these spiral it, nebulae? Are they inside great, of our galaxy? Is it a great debate? It's a great debate. Are they inside of our galaxy or are they outside? Um, and he believed they were outside and he, he showed that they were actually moving away from us. Um, he made the first discovery of the rotation of a spiral galaxy uh, using spectroscopy. He discovered the sodium layer. And if you don't know the sodium layer, the sodium layer is about 50 miles above the surface of the Earth. Um, so it's part of the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And it is where Things the get sodium... Salty. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it, um, it's sodium compounds, and they come from the vaporization of meteors. That's oh, where the sodium okay. comes from. Okay. Um, he also hired Clyde Tombaugh. Um, but, uh, Vesto was hired by Percival Lowell. Oh. So, but his legacy continues today because the Lowell Observatory continues with astronomical research. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, he, he, you know, he struck out on a couple things, but let's be honest, there's, there's a lot of physicists and astronomers and scientists who strike out. His heart was in the right place. Well, but his heart was in the right place. Yeah, he and, tried. And you know, we he are tried. we are kind of making fun of it a little bit. No, I will not. <laughs> uh, he said, Brandon says Henry Giclis was a great master debater. Well, you misspelled his name, but okay. I thought it was Giclis. It is, but it's G I C L A S. Well, I mean, yeah. Um, anyway, master debater. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so we, I mean, we're kind of making fun a little bit, but he, the Lowell Observatory, um, inspired the public. Um, he inspired the public. Mm-hmm. Um, sure, the whole Venus thing is a little bit funny, um, to be honest. Um, Something I would do. But he really was trying to just prove, um, he was trying to prove that, uh, you know, um, that there was life. He was trying to explain what he was seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, He could have made better choices. He could have talked to somebody who knows how to use a telescope, for one thing, which is ironic that the Lowell Observatory is a great place for astronomical research with good and properly used telescopes. In fact, they just opened with that new Discovery Telescope uh, last year, a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, Now, and they still have, I think, Lowell's original telescope or, like, the observatory, like, uh, building. So, without... And... And most importantly, though, most importantly, 
for Lowell is he provided us with kind of the blueprint on how we do make uh, observatories now. Mm -hmm. We do put them high up yeah. where the atmosphere yeah, is, a, is stable. Um, and so, you know, his, his legacy, sure, is something that we can kind of laugh about in places. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, but without Lowell, we don't have what we have today. Mm -hmm. We don't have that understanding of, you know, galactic redshifts that was done at the Lowell Observatory. Mm -hmm. And then Hubble. By investor Slif Slifer. Slifer, yeah. And so uh, Hubble leans on Vesto um, and, and all that. But, but Vesto could not have done it if Lowell had not hired him to come out west because mm -hmm. I think uh, Vesto is from Indiana or oh, Illinois. Oh, I thought it says a Clyde Tombaugh hired. Oh, yeah, he Vesto hired, hired, Vesto Clyde hired Tomba. Tomba. Um, Clyde Tombaugh probably would not have been hired. Yeah. Sure, they would have probably had somebody else find yeah. him. But, um, um, yeah, and so the legacy of Percival mm -hmm. Lowell continues today. I mean, he has, a, how many people have a legacy? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, because history books and stuff, but, you know, I mean, out of all the people that's ever lived on this pale blue dirt dot, uh, not a lot have legacies. Shoulders of Giants, Brandon's right in chat, Shoulders of Giants. Shoulders and I guess, of Giants. You know, a, a Lowell, I would say, is like a mini giant, you know? He's a little giant. <laughs> it's just a mini, a, 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 a mini giant. He's one rung in a giant ladder. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I, you, you had, you have to have people like Lowell mm -hmm. uh, that ha come from great wealth to build observatories where they want to build them. It would be really nice. And it would be really nice if we had more people like this. Um, more people using their money for the betterment of the world and for the advancement of our, our knowledge. knowledge and uh, civilization to boldly go where no oh, one wow. has gone. You're going to pull it all out, aren't you? Before. Yeah. It'd be great. Or it wasn't for just personal gain and how many yachts you can have and how many cars you could just fling into space randomly. Yeah, it'd be cool. Anyway, that's our look at Percival Law. <laughs> go to Flagstaff, Arizona if you're go if you're going in that direction. If you're planning a trip, if you want to go to a cool observatory, check out the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff. We've been there. Um, and it's really cool. They have a whole, like, they have, like, this whole little, like, planet walk. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're very much on the Pluto should be a planet train, but, you yeah, know, we'll talk about uh, that in whatever. A bit, but, yeah, um, we'll, we'll hang you, over that You shit. actually see, um, the, was it the blink comparator, whatever they call it, where, um, you can actually see it flip between the pictures that Clyde That show, used, that oh, show this Pluto is can't be a star because it's clearly, mm -hmm. stars aren't going to move that much. Um, we're not going to notice that. Uh, so it's a really cool place to visit. So, uh, go check it out. Flagstaff is on a few in the area. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can also head over to Media Crater. But that's our look at Percival Lowell. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, again, check us out on all the things. Check, uh, hang out with us for, uh, I'm going to call it the shot, but that's not it. Hangover. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, we'll see you in two weeks where we talk about, we have a high in the sky for December. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, guys. Stay safe. Stay healthy. We'll see you in two weeks. Cheers.